Hi friends, welcome to chapter two of Dawn Treader. Uh, On Board the Dawn Treader is our next chapter. I hope you guys are having a great day and happy Cinco de Mayo. Um, it, the sun is starting to try and come out, so I hope it'll start to warm up a little bit so we can go outside and enjoy the warmth again. Uh, but until then, here's our second chapter. Ah, there you are, Lucy, said Caspian. We were just waiting for you. This is my captain, the Lord Drinian. A dark-haired man went down on one knee and kissed her hand. The only others present were Reepicheep and Edmund. Where's Eustace? asked Lucy. In bed, said Edmund, and I don't think we can do anything for him. It only makes him worse if you try to be nice to him. Meanwhile, said Caspian, we want to talk. By Jove we do, said Edmund, and first, about time. It's a year ago by our time since we left you, just before your coronation. How long has it been in Narnia? Exactly three years, said Caspian. All going well? asked Edmund. You don't suppose I'd left my kingdom if, and put to sea unless all was well, answered the king. It couldn't be better. There's no trouble at all now between telmarines, dwarves, talking beasts, fawns, and the rest. And we gave those troublesome giants on the frontier such a good beating last summer that they pay us tribute now. And I had an excellent person to leave as regent while I'm away. Trumpkin, the dwarf, do you remember him? Oh, dear Trumpkin, said Lucy, of course I do. You, wouldn't, you couldn't have made a better choice. Loyal as a badger, ma'am, and valiant as, as a mouse, said Drinian. He had been going to say as a lion, but had noticed Reepicheep's eyes fixed on him. And where are we heading for? asked Edmund. Well, said Caspian, that's a long story. Perhaps you remember that when I was a child, my usurping uncle Miraz got rid of seven friends of my father's, who might have taken my part, by sending them off to explore the unknown eastern seas beyond the Lone Islands. Yes said Lucy, and none of them ever came back. Right, well, on my coronation day, with Aslan's approval, I swore an oath that, if once I established peace in Narnia, I would sail east myself for a year and a day to find my father's friends, or learn of their deaths, and avenge them if I could. These were their names, the Lord Revelion, the Lord Burn, the Lord Argos, the Lord Mavramorn, the Lord Octasian, the Lord Restamar, and, oh, the other one who's so hard to remember. The Lord Hroop, sire, said Drinian. Hroop, Hroop, of course, said Caspian. That is my main intention, but Reepicheep here has an even higher hope. Everyone's eyes turned to the mouse. As high as my spirit, it said, Though perhaps as small as my stature, why should we not come to the very eastern end of the world? And what might we find there? I expect to find Aslan's own country. It is always from the east, across the sea, that the great lion comes to us. I say that is an idea, said Edmund in an awed voice. But do you think, said Lucy, Aslan's country would be that sort of country? I mean, the sort you could ever sail to? I do not know, madame, said Reepicheep, but there is this. When I was in my cradle, a wood woman, a dryad, spoke this verse to me. Where sky and water meet, where the waves grow sweet, doubt not, Reepicheep, to find all you seek there is the utter east. I do not know what that means, but the spell of it has been me all my life. After a short silence, Lucy said, and where are we now, Caspian? The Caspian, the captain can tell you better than I, said Caspian. So Drinian got out his chart and spread it over the on the table. That's our position, he said, laying his finger on it or was at noon today. We had a fair wind from Care Paravel and stood a little north for the, a little north for Galma, which we made on the next day. We were in port for a week, 
for the Duke of Dalma made a great tournament for his majesty, and there he unhorsed many knights. And got a few nasty falls myself, Drinian. Some of the bruises are still there, put in Caspian. And unhorsed many knights, repeated Drinian with a grin. We thought the Duke would have been pleased if the King Majesty's Majesty would have married his daughter, but nothing came of that. Squinson has freckles, said Caspian. What is wrong with squinting and having freckles? Caspian should know better. And we sailed from Galma, continued Drinian, and ran into a calm for the best part of two days and had to row, and then had wind again and did not make Terranbithia till the fourth day from Galma. And there their king sent out a warning not to land, for there was sickness in Terranbithia. But we doubled the cape and put in at a little creek far from the city and water. Then we had to lie off for three days before we got a southeast wind and stood out for seven isles. The third day out a pirate, Terranbithia by her rig, overhauled us. But when she saw us well armed, she stood off after shooting of arrows on either part. And we ought to have given her chase and boarded her um, and took their ship said Ripachip. And in five days more, we were in sight of Muil, which, as you know, is the westernmost of the Seven Isles. Then we rode through the straits and came about sundown into Red Haven on the Isle of Bren, where we were lovingly feasted and had victuals and water at will. We left Red Haven six days ago and have made marvelously good speed, so that I hope to see the Lone Islands the day after tomorrow. The sum is, we are now thirty days at sea and have sailed more than four hundred leagues from Narnia. And after the Lone Islands, said Lucy, no one knows, your majesty, answered Drinian, unless the Lone Islanders themselves can tell us. They couldn't in our days, said Edmund. Then, said Ribachi, it is after the Lone Islands that the adventure really begins. Caspian now suggested that they might like to be shown over the ship before supper, but Lucy's conscience, conscience smote her and she said, I think I really must go and see Eustace. Seasickness is horrid, you know. If I had my old cordial with me, I could cure him. But you have, said Caspian. I'd quite forgotten about it. As you left it behind, I thought it might be regarded as one of the royal treasures, and so I brought it. If you think that it ought to be wasted on a thing like seasickness, it'll only take a drop, said Lucy. Caspian opened one of the lockers beneath the bench and brought out the beautiful little diamond flask which Lucy remembered so well. Take back your own, queen, he said. Then they left the cabin and went out into the sunshine. In the deck there were two large long hatches, fore and aft of the mast and both open, as they always were in fair weather, to let light and air into the belly of the ship. Caspian led them down a ladder into the after hatch. Here they found themselves in a place where benches for rowing ran from side to side, and the light came in through the oar holes and danced on the roof. Of course, Caspian's ship was not that horrible thing, a galley rowed by slaves. Oars were used only when wind failed or for getting in and out of the harbor, and everyone except Reepicheep, whose legs were too short, had often taken a turn. At each side of the ship, the space under the benches was left clear for the rowers' feet, but all down the center there was a kind of pit which went down to the very keel, and this was filled with all kinds of things. Sacks of flour, casks of water, barrels of pork, jars of honey, skin bottles of tea, apples, nuts, cheeses, biscuits, turnips, sides of bacon. From the roof, that is, from under the side of the deck, hung hams and strings of onions, and also the men of the watch off duty in their hammocks. Caspian led them aft, stepping from bench to bench, at least it was stepping for him and something between a step and a jump for Lucy, and a real long jump for Ribachip. In this way, they came to a partition with a door in it. Caspian opened the door and led them into a cabin which filled the stern underneath the deck cabins. 
It was, of course, not so nice. It was very low, and the sides sloped together as they went down so that there was hardly any floor. And though it had windows of thick glass, they were not made to open because they were underwater. In fact, at this very moment, the ship, as the ship pitched, they were alternately golden with sunlight and dim green with the sea. You and I must lodge here, Edmund, said Caspian. We'll leave your kinsmen the bunk and sling hammocks for ourselves. I beseech your majesty, said Drinian. No, no, shipmate, said C Caspian. We have argued all that out already. You and Prince, Prince was the mate, so I believe that is the second to the captain, are sailing the ship and will have cares and labors many a night when we are singing catches or telling stories, so you and he must have the port cabin above. King Edmund and I can lie very snug here below, but how is the stranger? Eustace, very green in the face scowled and asked whether there was any sign of the storm getting less. But Caspian said, what storm? And Drinian burst out laughing. Here is a picture of Eustace right here. He's sick and everybody else talking. Storm, young master, he roared. This is as fair weather as a man could ask for. Who's that? said Eustace irritably. Send him away. His voice goes through my head. I've brought you something that will make you feel better, Eustace, said Lucy. Oh, go away and leave me alone, growled Eustace. But he took a drop from her flask, and though he said it was beastly stuff, the smell in the cabin when she opened it was delicious. It is certain that his face came the right color a few moments and after he swallowed it. And he must have felt better because instead of wailing about the storm in his head, he began demanding to be put ashore and said that at the first port he would lodge a disposition against them with the British Council. But when Reepicheep asked what a disposition was and how you lodged it, Reepicheep thought it was some new way of arranging a single combat. Eustace could only reply, fancy not knowing them that. In the end, they succeeded in convincing Eustace that they were already sailing as fast as they could toward the nearest land they knew, and that they had no more power of sending him back to Cambridge, which was where Uncle Harold lived, than of sending him to the moon. After that, he sulkily agreed to put on fresh clothes, which had been put out for him, and come on deck. Caspian now showed them over the ship, though indeed they had seen most of it already. They went up on the forecastle and saw the lookout man standing on a little shelf inside the gilded dragon's neck and peering through its open mouth. Inside the forecastle was the galley, or the ship's kitchen, and quarters for such people as the boatswain, the carpenter, the cook, and the master archer. If you think it odd to have the galley in the bows, imagine the smoke from its chimney streaming back over the ship. That is because you are thinking of steamships, where there is always a headwind. On a sailing ship, the wind is coming from behind, and anything smelly is put as far forward as possible. They were taken up to the fighting top, and at first it was rather alarming to rock to and fro there and see the deck looking small and far away beneath. You realized that if you fell, there was no particular reason why you should fall on board, rather in the sea. Then they were taken to the poop deck, where Rince was on duty with another man at the great tiller, and behind that the dragon's tail rose up, covered with gilding, and round inside it ran a little bench. The name of the ship was the Dawn Treader. She was only a little bit of a thing compared with one of our ships or even with the cogs, drummonds, carracks, and galleons which Narnia had owned when Lucy and Edmund had reigned there under Peter as the High King. For nearly all navigation had died out in the reigns of Caspian's ancestors. When his uncle, Miraz the Usurper, had sent the seven lords to sea, they had to buy a galleon ship and man it with hired galleon sailors. 
But now Caspian had begun to teach the Narnians to be seafaring folk once more, and the Dawn Treader was the finest ship he had built yet. She was so small that, forward of the mast, there was hardly any deck room between the central hatch and the ship's boat on one side, and the hen coop, Lucy fed the hens, on the other. But she was a beauty of her kind, a lady, as sailors say, her lines perfect, her colors pure, and every spar and rope and pin lovingly made. Eustace, of course, could be, would be pleased with nothing and kept on boasting about liners and motorboats and aeroplanes and submarines, as if he, he knew anything about them, muttered Ed, Edmund. But the other two were delighted with the Don Treader, and when they returned aft to the cabin and supper and saw the whole western sky lit up with an immense crimson sunset and felt the quiver of the ship and tasted the salt on their lips and thought of the unlands on the eastern rim of the world, Lucy felt that she was almost too happy to speak. What Eustace thought had, had best be told in his own words, for when they all got their clothes back, dried, next morning, he at once got out a little black notebook and a pencil and started to keep a diary. He always had this notebook with him and kept a record of his marks in it, for though he didn't care much about any subject for its own sake, he cared a great deal about marks or grades and would even go to people and say, I got so much. What did you get? But as he didn't seem likely to get many marks on the Dawn Treader, he now started a diary. This was the first entry. <clears throat> August 7th. Have now been 24 hours on this ghastly boat if it isn't a dream. All the time a frightful storm has been raging. It's a good thing I'm not seasick. Huge waves kept coming, keep coming in over the front and I have seen the boat nearly go under any number of times. All the others pretend to take no notice of this either from swank or because Harold says one of the most cowardly things ordinary people do is to shut their eyes to facts. It's madness to come out to sea in a rotten little thing like this, not much bigger than a lifeboat, and of course, absolutely primitive indoors. No proper saloon, no radio, no bathrooms, no deck chairs. I was dragged all over it yesterday evening, and it would make anyone sick to hear Caspian showing off his funny little toy boat as if it was the Queen Mary. I tried to tell him what real ships are like, but he's too dense. E and L, of course, didn't back me up. I suppose a kid like L doesn't realize the danger, and E is buttering up C, Caspian, as everyone does here. They call him a king. I said I was a Republican, but he had to ask me what that meant. He doesn't seem to know anything at all. Needless to say, I've been put in the worst cabin of the boat, a perfect dungeon, and Lucy has been given the whole room on deck to herself, almost a nice room compared to the rest of this place. C says that's because she's a girl. I tried to make him see what Alberta says that all that sort of thing is really lowering girls, but he was too dense. Still, he might see that I shall be ill if I'm kept in that hole any longer. E says we mustn't grumble because C is sharing it with us himself to make room for L, as if that didn't make it more crowded and far worse. Nearly forgot to say that there is also a kind of mouse thing that gives everyone the most frightful cheek. The others can put up with it if they like, but I shall twist his pretty tail soon if he tries it on me. The food is frightful, too. The trouble between Eustace and Reepicheep arrived even sooner than might have been expected. Before dinner the next day, when the others were sitting round the table waiting, being at sea gives one a magnificent appetite. Eustace came rushing in, wringing his hands and shouting out, that little brute has half killed me. I insist it being kept under control. I could bring an action against you, Caspian. I could order you to have it destroyed. At the same moment, Reepicheep appeared. His sword was drawn and his whiskers looked very fierce, but he was as polite as ever. I ask your pardons all, he said, and especially Her Majesty's. 
If I had known what he would he would take refuge here, I would have awaited a more reasonable time for his correction. What on earth is up? asked Edmund. What had really happened was this. Reepicheep, who never felt that the ship was getting on fast enough, loved to sit on the bulwarks far forward, just beside the dragon's head, gazing out at the eastern horizon and singing softly in his little chirruping voice the song the dryad had made for him. He never held on to anything. However, the ship pitched and kept his balance with perfect ease. Perhaps his long tail, hanging down to the deck inside the bulwarks, made this easier. Everyone on board was familiar with this habit, and the sailors liked it because when one was on lookout duty, it gave one somebody to talk to. Why exactly Eustace had slipped and reeled and stumbled all the way forward to the forecastle, he had not yet gotten his sea legs. I never heard. Perhaps he hoped he would see land, or perhaps he wanted to hang about the gallery and scrounge something. Anyway, as soon as he saw that long tail hanging down, and perhaps it was rather tempting, he thought it would be delightful to catch hold of it, swing Reepicheep round by it once or twice upside down, then run away and laugh. At first, the plan seemed to work beautifully. The mouse was not much heavier than a large cat. Eustace had him off the rail in a trice, and very silly he looked, thought Eustace, with his little limbs all splayed out and his mouth open. But unfortunately, Reepicheep, who had fought for his life many a time, never lost his head even for a moment, nor his skill. It is not very easy to draw one's sword when one is swinging round in the air by one's tail, but he did. And the next thing Eustace knew was two agonizing jabs in his hand, which made him let go of the tail. And the next thing after that was that the mouse had picked itself up again as if it were a ball bouncing off the deck, and there it was, facing him. And a long, horrid, bright, sharp thing like a skewer was waving to and fro within an inch of his stomach. This doesn't count as below the belt for mice in Narnia because they can hardly be expected to reach higher. Stop it, spluttered Eustace. Go away. Put that thing away. It's not safe. Stop it, I say. I'll tell Caspian. I'll have you muzzled and tied up. Why do you not draw your own sword, poltroon, cheeped the mouse. Draw and fight or I'll beat you black and blue with the flat. I haven't got one, said Eustace. I'm a pacifist. I don't believe in fighting. Do I understand, said Ripachi, withdrawing his sword for a moment and speaking very sternly, that you do not intend to give me satisfaction? I don't know what you mean, said Eustace, nursing his hand. If you don't know how to take a joke, I shan't bother my head about you. Then take that said Reepicheep, and that to teach you manners and the respect due to a knight and a mouse and a mouse's tail. And at each word he gave Eustace a blow with the side of his rapier, his, his sword, which was thin, fine, dwarf-tempered steel and as supple and effective as a birch rod. Eustace, of course, was at a school where they didn't have corporal punishment, so the sensation was quite new to him. This, that was why, in spite of having no sea legs, it took him less than a minute to get off that forecastle and cover the whole length of the deck and burst in at the cabin door, still hotly pursued by Ribachi. Indeed, it seemed to Eustace that the rapier, as well as the pursuit, was hot. It might have been red hot by the feel. There was not much difficulty in settling the matter once Eustace realized that everyone took the idea of a duel seriously and heard Caspian offering to lend him a sword and Drinian and Edmund discussing whether he ought to be handicapped in some way to make up for his being so much bigger than Reepicheep. He apologized sulkily and went off with Lucy to have his hand bathed and bandaged and then went to his bunk. He was careful to lie on his side. I hope Eustace has learned his lesson with Reepicheep. He is not a mouse to be reckoned with.
Well, we have made it to chapter three. I hope you guys are enjoying so far. Our next chapter is called The Lone Islands. Here is a map of them. So I'm sure there will be more action next chapter. We'll find out. Until then, I hope you guys have a great rest of your day and I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.